Joey, Brian, a lot of you were here last year when we did this. Um, and for those of you who weren't, some of you may have seen it or heard about it. Uh, let me start off with this question and just feel free to chime in as you may. And if you don't have a microphone, we'll just make sure we get it to you all up here. Uh, but the first question I have for you guys, when you look at some of the things we talked about last time, crime, uh, socioeconomic problems, um, finances, are things better or worse than they were a year ago? Depend on what side of town you live in, to be honest. Um, if you're on the east side of Truce and now on the east side of Paseo or Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, there's not very many opportunities. But we see development. We see things get, being built downtown um, in the suburbs. Um, and then if you look at some of the infrastructure, it's hard for some of our people to get to some of these places as well. Um, so I just think it, 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 there are some good things, but what are the things that's necessary to us and our people in our communities? I'm not sure that we're thriving like the rest of the people are. Is Kansas City better off than it was a year ago? We worse? I would say when you think about <clears throat> the crime and uh, the number of youth that are losing their lives, and I had an opportunity to uh, visit with one of our students that was recently shot and um, thinking about the pain of that family having to deal with the loss of a son, but then even the nine-year-old that was shot as a part of that, it, it does take, it, it's a debilitating impact on families. It, it impacts them socially and emotionally, often becoming impediments to them being able to achieve at a high level academically. And so, I do believe that absent of economic development, East of Truce, until we begin to have that intentionality around development in the communities that truly meet the definition of blight, where TIF opportunities can take advantage to help revitalize a community, I mean, I don't know how fast, how quick we can begin to shift some of this stuff. So it is gonna require that people become more vocal and for the people who don't have a voice, people in this room and many people in this city that are in positions of influence and power, we have to step up and we have exactly. to articulate what we demand, uh, especially out of these projects that could help see that we have an economic boost within these communities. And I think that will begin to eradicate some of this stuff. I think the lie that we tell each other sometimes is that if, if the economy gets better, there we go. Uh, that somehow we can participate. There we go. And, and that's just not true, right? So it, when you ask whether or not things are better, things may be better for a lot of people, but they're just not, they're the same for the people who live in the core because you, you're, you lack the ability to just engage or get any of that, the, the piece of the pie, right? So we, the schools in, for example, in, in Kansas City, Missouri, they, they're, I think they're not, uh, they're just now getting an accreditation. They really shouldn't be. Like, if you look at how they got their accreditation back, they, they shouldn't have gotten their accreditation. They just cheated on the numbers to, to say the schools were, were, were accredited. So just take that example. You have these kids, right? They graduate from a failing school district, and they, 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 they come out into the Kansas City, Missouri uh, area, and then there's tons of opportunities, let's just say, how are they going to engage or get a part of that opportunity when they're not equipped to do so? And so we're not the we don't we don't get the same uh, we don't get the same level of, of of stuff that everybody else gets, right? And we didn't just you know I know I'm going to be different in this respect. When we talk about these things, we talk about what are we going to do to fix the community that we didn't break, right? We didn't break the community. We didn't we didn't. We didn't subject a whole group of people to years and years of apartheid in America. We didn't break the school system. We didn't, we didn't maintain blight in the inner city. We didn't, uh, we, we didn't uh, engage in environmental racism in the city. We never did all of the things that broke the community. And yet when it comes time to talk about solutions, we always ask what the people who got broken are gonna do to fix their own situation. All I'm saying is a lot of stuff has to happen before we can fix situations for, for violence because violence is the last alternative for broken people and you won't go anywhere in the entire world and find a situation where you have the poorest, most oppressed people doing anything but committing violence and crime. 
Uh, hold on a second. I want, I, want to, I want to go back to this conversation. Uh, I'm going to keep this, this question going, but is there anything you want to say about the district? Yeah, I, do. I mean, I'm interested in, in that comment about cheating because, I mean, I think, you know, we're, we're held accountable to the, the state of Missouri and what Missouri rates school districts on is basically where you get your points. So when you say on Channel 41 News that the district cheated, well, number one, we don't have our full accreditation. We're provisionally accredited. We're working towards it, but when you say cheat, I mean that's that's a pretty harsh word for me as a superintendent, you know, well, to sit here and, and and let that pass. So I I, I do need you to kind of sure I'd love to. <clears throat> but what they did, what they did is instead of instead of doing it like every other district and actually get their accreditation uh, the right way, in my opinion, what they did was they said that they were not going to count. They they weren't they literally weren't going to count anybody who was who was not already on on grade level. And so, so right. when, you, when you do an accreditation, right, it's all, it should be about how people are passing standardized tests. That's how they do it everywhere where else, right? The kids didn't pass the standardized, the standardized tests and they still got their accreditation because, the, because they simply decided that they would tell you if you were on grade level. So, for example, if you, if, for example, if you were, uh, if you are, were uh, a, a grade 10 student, right, but you tested on a grade nine level, then they, then you just didn't take the test. So they would they would just count the people who were on uh, th that were. So if you were if if you were in grade ten, um, and testing on grade level, then you got counted in the test, and the other people right, weren't. Yeah, so, so. Well, he must be talking about some stuff before I got here. I'm assuming this was something that happened before 2016. But I got I got to think real quick about the okay. education though, right? Like so. Education is, is a part of the situation, but if you keep creating resources and tools and I'm not going to go after the tools, you have to address the thought process. And I think that's where the problem is because we, we, we're dealing with a lot of Band-Aid issues right now. My, my wound is gaping, you know what I mean? And you're putting gauze on something that's eternally bleeding. So what I'm saying is until, until you address the, the conscious or the, the conditioning, it doesn't matter. You can have tool after tool. You can have resource after resource. You can make college free. It doesn't matter. But because think about it like this. I'm hungry. I'm about to go find some need. I'm going to steal. I'm going to do whatever it takes because all, all my life I've been surviving. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So now what you're telling me is stop surviving. I want you to live. Here's some educational things. These are living things. But I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to feed my kids today. So what I'm saying is with with that situation, yes, the education is is, is important, but it's not. It's not it, you dig what I mean? And I say that because a prime example is I can go down the street to a food pantry if I'm hungry, but why, why is that not an option? You see what I mean? You want, me to, you want to tell me algebra is important, but algebra ain't about to pay my bills right now, even though systemically it is, because algebra is paying your checkbook, balancing a checkbook, right? But only until I realize the importance of it will I begin to even take any of this series. If you're telling me I need an A in my class, why? My mom ain't got no A, my dad ain't got no A, he's locked up. You see what I'm saying? So only until you address the thought process, and that's that's why exactly. my program is so important because it changes the neuro. It's called neuroplasticity, and it rewrites the, the thought process, the, the neuro neurological pathways. And what we're saying is, if you introduce a new tool to an old situation, now you're opening up the box, because all we're saying is push education, push education, push education, which is cool. I'm for education, 110 percent, but only until I value education will education be important to me, mm. and I think. Gentlemen, uh, still hold on a second, gentlemen. Still uh, think about your answers. Hold the, hold those thoughts. While we have the councilman here for a limited period of time, a few people mentioned the East Side development. I just want to get your take on that. What can we expect from the current body? I'm gonna say exactly the same sentiment that he was saying, and that's my issue that I have when we convene meetings around violent issues and reducing crime. If we're not addressing the socialistic and culturalistic influence, Facts. we're not Factory doing anything. Exactly. So the first Facts. question about Kansas City. Is it better? Is it worse? It depends on what culture you live in. If you live in the culture from the east side, it's worse. If you live anywhere else, it's actually better. But that's culturalistic values. So when we talk about, and I, and I agree with his sentiment, uh, with inter introducing new tools and working on thought processes and how we see stuff, even going back to the underlying comment about the educational attainment, kids get inside of Kansas City school districts. We don't own none of our schools. I think, and I just left the state, so I know a little bit 
about what happened in the past. I think Mr. Bedell has been doing a good job at the school district, but we don't own our schools. So we don't own our curriculum, which goes mm -hmm. back to the thought process, what is culturalistically important and what is socially acceptable. The same when we talk about development. Development is only good in incidents where people have ownership. Mm -hmm. If you don't have ownership, that. then development serves you no, no, it shows you no benefit. At only all. thing you have is higher taxation because of the property values or whatever has been placed in your community that you don't own. And if we want to get to a situation in which we decrease the violence here in Kansas City, decrease the recidivism rate in Kansas City, and increase the product productivity on the east side, then the only thing, in my opinion, that matters is addressing the socialistic and culturalistic influences and the lack thereof. And right. that is easier to address than it is to make excuses. And all we do is make excuses of why we have crime and we're not exposing and or being serious about action. Simple and plain. And that's going to take the truth about just everything, the mindset, the nature of the young. I imagine we're talking about black, you know, community, the, the, the kids and what, the nature of their mind, the system set up, you know, it ain't, it ain't, it's, it's just what it is. It, it, we've got people that's breaking it, thinking past it, but if you don't know when you're subjected to think this is what you are, you know, you're missing something. But this thing, I'm looking around, everybody my age or a little above, we got it that they not getting. And, you know, they need a good old-fashioned game of Connect Four. You know what I'm saying? Something that challenges them is strategy. Break them out of the everyday monotony of, you know what I'm saying? It, it, but it, it starts with what are the teachers teaching? You know, what are the, the parents teaching? Like so exactly. much, I think the Willie Lynch letter should be installed in every school in Kansas City. You know, because it, it'll open their eyes to, to why, they, why we here. But not to focus on that gather that and then become and understand what you can be you know but every you know it's, it's not being taught and we can't hide the truth from it it helps with exactly. the mindset and how to think the processing of thinking cultivating the habit of thinking because you ain't doing that you missing the greatest pleasure in life and if i can say one thing off of what he's just saying so let's say the really lynch letter is real then a smart culture will reverse engineer that. So if it's real to break up the family causes uh, structural dysfunctionality, then the family should be one of the first uh, paradigms. When we talk racially or socially, we talk about racial uh, 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 people, black people, Latinos, et cetera, that don't get taught their history in school. But then we don't own schools or educational outlets. When we talk about police brutality, and seeing that the police come through our areas and they don't look like the people that live there. We don't get on the police boards. We don't become police officers. Ownership is critical. And ownership goes back to what we think, even when we talk about bad parents. If you think it's bad parents out there, then we should be producing programs for those bad parents to go through as opposed to saying, you know, little Junebug is bad because his mama is out there. How do we do that? Very, very simple. Right here, we have a spoken word artist. We have a cat here that uh, has a program that does with researching and changing the trajectory of how we think. So what we should be a series of how we appropriate and fund our programs and what we allow to be accepted in our community. It's, no, it should be the, which no programs good. we choose, not, not no, even no, cut you off. No, so, so what's going on is they're investing, so a corporation will spend $30,000 on one person to teach this cognitive behavior design, and it increases productivity of their whole business if they invest $30,000 into one person with this thing. So I'm not saying we need to create a new wheel. The wheel's out there. The uh, Life Connections program in the federal system re uh, reduces recidivism rate by 70%. I mean, the wheel's out there, you know what I mean? It's coupling it, it's reaching out to things that, that are maybe outside, because you only know what you know, keeping it all the way real. You only know what you know. And anything outside of what you know is, is just taboo. So what I'm saying is, you can give somebody the knowledge, you can give somebody the application, you can give somebody the wisdom, but what solidifies it, what's a strong enough reinforcer is when you actually create a environment in which everything you talk can be walked out in. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So now, not only is I'm getting reinforced by my mentors, my teachers, my counselors, when I go into this environment, this environment is telling me the exact same thing. All I'm saying is all you gotta do is create it. Exactly. It's, 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 not, it's not a brand new topic, it's not a brand new idea. They're doing it in the federal systems and they're doing it in the state prisons, but why wait till you get incarcerated exactly. to get $30,000 worth of information exactly. when you can already get it out here on the streets? Yeah. So that's why this Lyrics Institution is so, is so, I'm pounding it so hard coming fresh out, 
is because it's working. Let me get because one more answer to this right. question. Let me get one more answer to this question. We're gonna move on because I, I promise I'll keep you for about an hour. Uh, is Kansas City better or worse than it was a year ago? Um, I, I think I think it's it's all in the mentality. I think it all re relates to the conversation. So I would invite us to perhaps even expand. My brother's talking about the elasticity of the brain and the mind. I would ask us to even expand our definition of what education really is. Facts. I think true, yeah. I think true education is discovery of it's self. self. Not as a self. A, 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 a child educated only in school is an uneducated job. Facts. So we have, to, we have to do a better job of educating ourselves about the true plight and blight that our communities are faced with. I mean, we often use these terms like underserved, but we never consider that there's an overserved. And so we, to, to my brother's point about the fact that we didn't create the communities in which we live. We didn't create the choose corridor. We are lived, we are, we are, we, we are, we have to suffer because of it. We're conditioned by it, but we didn't create it. Let's talk about the creation of that and the study of history and truly understand the truth about America and what it, what it, what it has been. I mean, we're often asked to examine ourselves and examine our strengths and our weaknesses. Why can't we do the same about our country? Why can't we do the same about our city? It is only in an effort to get us better. But I think that us black men standing in, in, in unity and in, in, in our various sectors of life, we will continue. I'm not saying we haven't because many of you brothers have been. So and what, still continue to do that, but we, we need to continue to position ourselves and empower others to do the same. So what role do we all play in this room then in trying to make this plight better? And how can we make it better? I play a role just by doing the workshops for young men. You know, when I started doing my workshops, I started. I wanted to think about something that they were not getting in schools. Back in my day, we had on home economics where they taught us how to cook meals, a uh, lot of training stuff. We don't have that anymore. So now I'm teaching young boys how to cook meals. This weekend, I have a workshop where I'm teaching them how to tie a tie, how to iron, teach them about resume writing, teach them about credit, all the things that they do not have on a daily basis that is essential to their life. So that's one thing that I'm making better for our youth. I think that one of the biggest problems when you look at the violence in Kansas City is you have a lot of people who just have conflict, who ha can't figure out conflict. But we walk in this room and everybody's in here hugging, slapping five. Everybody in this room is like a family in this room. Some of you I've never met, but we all hugged and said, hey, what's going on? How many of us have taken a young man out or did a shadowing at your job? How many of you <coughs> are doing things with young people that are that uh, just showing your everyday life. You know, you look at this, we see a lot of young men who don't have positive role models in their homes, and we, be we begin to be that person for a lot of young men. So I just think it's, it's about, you know, every day being a positive role model in your own world, and hopefully it just expands. We just got to keep doing it. Yeah, to piggyback off what you was talking about, I feel like, and you're 100% right, but I feel like a lot of times we preach it to the choir. I really do. Um, and each one of us, we have our own audience, for lack of a better term. Channel 41, High 103. Ray injects his uh, thing into the youth with what he does. Dr. Bedell with the Kansas City School District. But And I feel like it takes each and every one of us to inject into the youth that we serve, with, whether it's my football team or whether I have to watch what I say on air on High 103 Jams just to make sure that I'm not sending out the wrong message if I want to play around or whatever. I may always have to make sure that they are looking at us because they are, to your point. The kids are always looking at us and what we're doing. Do you think that there's some kid on, on 12th Street that's, that's ever seen black men hug each other or talk to each other? other with endearment very very rarely do some kids see that and I feel like with us coming together with this the stigmatism with black man is that we're violent or we curse or we drink or whatever when each and every one of us serves a, a positive purpose and I feel like the more that we inject into the youth that we serve with each one of our audiences the better it could be I want to I want to talk about um, your question is what are we doing individually uh, particularly, I run a program called Caring for Crime Survivors. I repair homes in neighborhoods that have been shot up, normally due to no fault of the person who I'm serving. So if a shootout breaks out in the neighborhood and five houses are hit and they were minding their business, I show up with a construction crew, put your windows back in place, repair your siding, your walls, your doors, all this. And the reason it, it, it makes sense is, number one, broken windows theory is real. So if we break one window and never fix it, 
then people come along and say, okay, well, it's okay to break some more windows. I pastor a church. When they dump on my vacant lots, if I don't get it up in 72 hours, they come and dump some more. What we, what we attempt to do with this is make neighborhoods whole again so people see that just because that when a window breaks, it's not that we don't care that the window is broken. We're coming to fix it because the message we want to send is that this neighborhood still has value and we care about this neighborhood. And, and as, that's the way I approach it. The second thing is I want to help people who experience a trauma. I went into a house uh, last year. This is my second year in this program. And last year from January to October, which was my cycle, I did over 100 homes. This year, I did 100 from May till now. So if there's any consolation to your question of where we are. With that, you know, and it's, 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 it's what I'll do respect. I don't, I don't mean no harm to nobody here when I speak. How good a neighborhood if the people don't unite, though? You know, if they not blending in, within the neighborhood, you can fix it up. It can look nice like my, my house. You know, I don't cut my grass so somebody can come knock on my door and complain about it. How you doing? It's nice to meet you. You know what I'm saying? So we can be intentional. I go out, I wave at them, they look at me like I'm crazy. You know what I'm saying? And, and I've, I've seen the other side. You know, I've not always been out here in the freedom of, but you know, come up high. And it helps me see like, man, we really lost, we don't even speak to each other. You know, I would hug a man before we go lock down for the night. Yeah. Cause he might not be there in the morning. And you know what I'm saying? And I just spent all day hanging, you know, things like that, you get to know a person, but it's just being intentional. We have to be a bit more intentional with as many kids as possible. Like, if you know, he do so much joy, but just like me, I go grab this girl, I know she got some kids, this girl, you know, and, you know, but bring the kids together, at least they can be kids together. You know, challenge them. Like I said, man, Kyle, I'm learning games, playing with them, and just to get them out of the habit of the everyday thing that they do, just playing the phone, the sports thing. That's what's up, sports is always good, but sports can bring about a, a brutalness when you don't know that you gold inside. Education is not just books. Yeah. yeah. And you don't get educated just in a school building. So where I am now is because I have had the opportunity of a lot of strong men around me that groomed me while I was growing up. And a lot of the youth I see every day don't have that. It's always a mama, an aunt, a grandma. I mean, even Dr. Bedell asked me, he said, hey, when they come in, you count how many men you see. So last year it was six. And I talked to a lot of kids. Over the course of how long? The whole year. The whole year. Six kids. I had six, six men, men right. that came in the door with a student to sit down and have a conversation with me. Mm. All the time it's a woman. It's a mother, an aunt, a grandma. And I'm not saying that they ain't working their butts off and trying to be, you know, that strong superwoman. But I'm sorry, but we need to man up. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And we don't have, we, we out here laying them out. But we ain't taking care of them. Right, and yeah. so when you say, it, like, kids cross your path. I mean, I met Joy when he was 12. I don't know. Yeah, I'm only fit three years older than him. But anyway. <laughs> yeah. 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 When he was 12, my thing was is that when you connect with, with people and you, you see something in them, then you spend that time to say, let me pull that out so you can see it. Everyone in this room is vested. How do we get people who will be watching this story when it's cut down to, you know, two, three-minute stories? How do we get them to get invested in this? Because obviously we can't do it alone. We were here a year ago, and year to date, we're up in homicides, we're up in crime, we're up in uh, crime involving cats under the age of 24, which we'll get into in a minute. But how do we get everybody else to get invested in this? Honest observation and participation, and we've actually heard that uh, from various people that are doing things. But we learned to sell dope by watching people that were selling dope. And it'd be the same to learn to be positive or to learn thyself exactly. by watching people, observing and participation. So when it comes to black men actually authentically engaging with the community and doing things, we have to, and I'm just give you a, a story. So I often uh, refer to myself as a gangster. I was sitting in the house one day and my son walked by and he's like, I'm a gangster. And I looked at him, who are you talking to, man? Well, you say it all the time, daddy. Ah, you're right, but I mean in a different context. I mean in an ownership of everything around me. So I had to change my articulation <clears throat> and the same with my dress. I have tattoos everywhere, but I noticed that when I walk down 39th and Prospect or South Bidden and I'm in the suit, the same sentiment that you said by waving to people and talking to people, I get young cats, hey boy, you clean, man. 
So that's observation. Mm -hmm. So I wear suits when it's hot now. Because the more we observe us doing something mm -hmm. positive, the more we will be engaging in positive activity. So our interactions is extremely, uh, like my man said, we have to be intentional with how we move and we have to be intentional with what we no longer will allow to be cultural. <laughs> Uh, and I think if we start doing that, you will see that permeate throughout the city. With All My Brothers Keeper, we started a mission a couple years ago of just talking to people, holding the door for people when they come in the gas station. And you'll be surprised, like my man said, how people will look at you for being Absolutely. nice. Like, what are you holding the door for? But that's yeah. because we've been colonized internally to hate each other. And we yeah. don't do that with nobody else. But that goes to knowing yourself and how we participate. We often see young folks and we say nothing to them. I run up on all of them because I was you. But that's my participation. And I think if we do that and we do it authentically, you will see more people than getting engaged. And I use Ray as an example. We grew up in the same blocks. We didn't see people doing what he's doing. But seeing, seeing him do it, now some of his friends is doing it. And the same with Joy. The same with myself. I got people that holler at me all day long about running for office that never thought about getting in politics because they're observing somebody that comes from the block that they come from that hasn't changed his articulation or his motivation, and now they want to do it. And I think that's what we have to do to our youth. Like he said, the men don't show up. We don't, but we allow that to happen because we allow our boys to sit, at, sit around us, and we know you ain't seen your child. The culture itself is a movement. Yeah. Right. I think it's marketing one on one. We got to turn a one into a need. We have to create an environment that's t that's dope enough for them to actually get there and then have the people that are at the forefront of that of that event be guys that are really on something. You know what I mean? That are really pushing the agenda that are that have a knowledge of self that can say something to somebody. So we, we throw uh, a talent show. Well, who's the guys that's throwing the talent show? Well, they are all the activists in the town. Or they all they all the, the, the go-getters, the motivators in the town. Yeah. So then what we do is we pair them up and we set and we put them with you and I put them with you and we all got yeah. different aspects to play in. Yeah. And then you know what I mean? Now you have to create the one. Because I've been I've been I've been doing public speaking since I've been home, right? And it's like 10 kids here. I'm at the YMCA with uh, Leo up there on 31st. And it's 15 kids here. It's 20 kids here. Wait a minute. But when I'm at Hot Summer Nights, it's 100 and, you know what I mean? Remember back in the day, it was, they, they Jimmy Jam packed. But so how do you create it? And what I honestly believe is it's not going to be, it's not going to be those sitting here, come on, John, you know, you got to, you got to think better, John. You know, it's, it's not going to be that. It's, what's up, John? Hey, how was school today, man? You know what I mean? It, it might come from somebody that's... Yeah, we're fighting aspects of the culture that we've even embraced in an, in an attempt to sort of, uh, in, a, in an attempt to, to make uh, gold out of something that's bad. We've embraced even parts of our culture that are negative. If you listen to the music that, are, that we listen to, and I'm not, not even going to exclude myself, that we all like and listen to and what we think is cool and what we teach our kids is cool. Like if you've got nothing, right, at least you can be cool, right? So these kids, and I, I, I did a lot of criminal defense work. I've never seen a kid walk through the door and say, you know, I, I, that needs an attorney to, to represent them in a criminal defense capacity that just did it because they were greedy or whatnot. There's, there's a certain logic to what kids are doing. You know, if you can't eat, and you're exactly. fighting for limited resources. <clears throat> I don't mean real eat. I'm not, because you can always buy a dollar menu at McDonald's. If you want the kinds of things in the world that you see everybody else uh, have, like even everybody in this room who seems to have their act together, they're looking at you and they say they want that stuff too, you know, but they don't have the tools to get it. They're going to try their best that they can to get it. I don't want to water so, down so, the culture. So I'm going to blame parts of the culture that are just negative and we embrace well, well, it. We're not going to what you said. To tag on to what you said, is, you know, I heard Mr. Jake, T.D. Jake say, we eat on the level of our vision. So if more kids see us dressing like that and we're in that vision dressed like that, then you know what I mean? What do you all think about KCPD? Uh, how's KCPD doing right now? Horrible. They just threw, threw guns on me in the parking lot right just out here. They drew literal guns on me in the parking lot out here in front of my own building as I was coming to see Joey, one of the barbers at Joey's shop, to get my hair cut. When was this? This was, what, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, I'm driving from court. I'm driving down the road from court. I see the cops pull up, again, pull up uh, uh, for me, uh, beside me, look in my car, jump behind me, jump beside me. I said, I, I even had time to call upstairs 
to my uh, paralegal and say, hey, looks like I'm going to get pulled over and it's going to be on some bull. <laughs> and and, 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 and my, they, I had him on the speakerphone with me saying, hey, yeah, they're right behind you, Henry. I pull into the parking lot and before they even said a word to me, jumped out and put uh, and, and held me at gunpoint coming back to things. What they said is I was driving a luxury car, a Maserati. Apparently, I can't do that if I'm black. And uh, mm. said that, uh, and said that uh, um, I fit the, fit the description. I was just like this, you know, and, and had to get pulled up in front of my own building, uh, in front of all of my people, just uh, held at gunpoint. So... And I'm, and that's, I'm the guy everyone says, oh, you did all of the stuff that people are telling you you need to do in order to avoid that situation. But I'm here to tell you it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter who you are and whatnot. And if I'm a kid from the block, and, and I'm an immigrant, so I was a kid from the block, then you're not going to have any respect or love for the police because they do them 10 times worse. They didn't shoot me because I walked out with a suit on and I complied and put my hand on, on the hood because I've been trained and I know that. But if I'm just a kid just walking down the street and have to deal with that on a daily basis, I don't know how I think about the police. So I, I understand why people don't like the police and it comes from a good place. Two things. Uh, everybody in this room that graduated from high school here in Kansas City, raise your hand. So I don't think we're doing too bad. Um, the best way to fix a situation or a problem is to become part of the solution. 28 years ago, I decided I'm going to get on the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. Had a college degree, I could have moved somewhere else. But this is home for me. And I wanted to try to help home. By the grace of God, there are people that are alive today because I had on a uniform. So, sir, I'm sorry that you had the situation that you had. But the best way to fix those types of situations, to improve perception, is to become a part of the solution. Kansas City, Missouri Police Department, we very rarely lay people off. This job has allowed me to do things that, growing up as a poor black kid here in Kansas City, knowing lights not being on, drinking Kool-Aid without sugar in it, mm. I've got to travel the world. I've got to walk in and out of places that a lot of people don't get to. I walked up to that yellow tape a million times and raised it up and went up under it because at the time I was a homicide detective. So if you want to try to find a way to, in at least one way, help fix Kansas City, help make it so that it's not always a situation that you're getting pulled over and you don't know why, or when you do get pulled over, you don't see somebody that looks like you. Encourage more people to get on the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. I went to the feds because of 27th and Prospect, right? Like, real, keeping it 100. Uh, I'm, I was raised in the 50s, I've been beat up by the police, I've been all of the above, right? Now I play a whole different game. Like, I didn't sit down with the DA of Wyandotte County. I didn't sit down with, I got police officers that, are, that I do speaking engagements with, all of that, right? So I'm not going to say that it's all bad, and I'm not going to say it's all good. I'm definitely not going to say that, you know what I mean? Most but but at, the, at the same time, I want to give credence to the guys that are, the men and women that are in blue that are actually playing their part, because a lot of times they get left out. But let me, let me retract, all right, because keep it all the way real. I just think, honestly, the police department is afraid of us. They're so much afraid yeah. of us that they, they get so tough exactly. that they got to actually do too much. Mm -hmm. All right? And that's the God honest truth. I had a woman, I, I, my daughter's mother, the lady walks up into her house and was like, so what's going on? What, what are y'all doing? But she, I live in the suburbs now. You know what I mean? Like, I can finally, my father lives in the suburbs, right? They would have never addressed him like that. Excuse me, sir, how are you doing? Uh, there was a complaint, there was something that was going on. She was already aggressive because she wanted to... Uh, establish a level of respect before they even got there. So what happens is if you're establishing a level of respect and I'm demanding respect on this side, you, you see where the conflict is coming in and you're already aggressive. So now you got a, a people that are living at a high level of stress anyway because we're always uh, profiled, because we're always shot at, because the police is always talking bad to us, we already at 10. So if you come to me with 10 and we at 10, it's gonna be an issue anyway. You know, look at it from, he's saying, 
tell people to be officers. They have to approach this situation. We got people of our own we don't even speak to because he looked too high. Or right. He looked too, you know what I'm saying? So how are they no, to approach a situation where per- no, I'm not saying You I'm can't not, tell them that. You, you can't tell somebody, do better, do better, do better. That's been conditioned all their life that I should be afraid of this big black guy or these people are in the hood all day. I'm saying, of our, own, kill I'm each saying other. of our own to go what he's saying, to put them into the force because I'm not against it. You know what I'm saying? Why not we police ourselves? I mean, the Panthers did it. You know what I'm saying? Do they own neighborhoods? Why not enforce this? That's in our history. Find a way to recreate that. Not saying let's go be Panthers, but the manifesto, that, that should count for something. Exactly. If we're trying to do better with our young men and mold them to make, to fold, you know, fold their ties. Let me run some numbers by you guys. In 2015, there were 64 homicides from January 1 to September 9th today. 2016, 82 homicides. 2017, 107. 2018-92. So far today, from January 1 to September 9, 2019, we have 102 homicides. That's higher than every number I've mentioned, with the exception of the year 2017. When you want to do a further breakdown of these numbers, more than a third of the victims, more than a third of the suspects, are under the age of 24. One question, what do y'all think when y'all, when y'all hear that number, but two, what is the responsibility of not just the folks in this room, but everybody who will be watching this broadcast? What's the responsibility we share to, to, to fight those numbers, to make sure that people live to see our ages? If you know somebody younger than you or anybody with a gun, and you may be a gun hurdle, take them to the range. Like you used to teach us how to box when we was younger, so we'd know how to throw these hands. Teach them how to use them if they, you know they got them. So then, because when you're skillful with something, you know when you have to use it. You think a little better because you're scared. Mm-hmm. But when you're this fearful, way. it's the easiest thing to resolve to. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> yeah, so I- teach them. If you know somebody, like, be intentional, be responsible for everyone you come across because being elders, we're, it's our duty, period, exclamation mark. I think it's accountability. It's one of the big issues that we don't that we have is not holding our brothers, holding the next person accountable of their actions. Instead of we encouraging it, you know, you know your your brother's about to go out there and do something stupid. Instead, you rob with them. Instead of saying no, mm-hmm. don't do that, don't partake right. in that. And we we hold people accountable. They won't do go out there and do stuff like that. Instead of encouraging, that's one of our biggest issues in our community is encouraging the wrong things. You know, and, and when you said how's KCPD, I don't necessarily believe that. Joining the force is the solution, but KCPD joining with community is more of a solution than us joining cops. And that will actually help the community better and makes the, the, the brothers feel safer around KCPD instead of being afraid like they said. Because it's never going to, joining the force, you see black cops, it's not going to change your outlook on how they, you know, how you feel. Uh, I, I got to say that the police have been very, uh, have done a great thing for our program. We've had barbecues, we've had community work together. I, I know it's a tough job. I know I know it's rough. But but I think that we, we can't all sit here and say that it's all horrible. Somebody said it's twenty five percent. I don't know what that <clears> is. <throat> but I it, it might be. But but from where I sit, uh, I've seen the police in Kansas City do a lot of good things for young people. I just think the partnership has to be there and finding more ways that uh, young people can feel like policemen are safe. I remember uh, Officer Friendly was what it was called when I was a kid. Came to our school, sat sat down, had lunch with us, and just talked about this is what policemen do in the city. I think that that is lost somewhere. Uh, I think there's a few bad apples that are getting all the publicity of what policemen do here in Kansas City or in the country. So we have to reverse and change our narrative about ourselves. Exactly. I mean, because there's been a let's let's be honest. There's been a 400 year public relations campaign to convince us that we're something that we're not. And so if we begin to tell these young brothers who are carrying guns that you're not a criminal, that you're not violent, it's not, it's not an issue of pathology that you were just born with this inborn uh, a heritage and inheritance to be a violent person. We got to reverse that. We got to reverse that thinking. Right. Right. Similar to what you said, my brother, we have to begin to right. say positive things about ourselves and about our, in fact, in a, in a shameless plug, I wrote a book a couple of years ago that says, Are We Really Crabs in a Barrel? I'm trying to challenge this notion that we've been conditioned to say that, oh, black people just crabs in a barrel, we're trying to pull each other down. But but let's flip that. What if the crab is trying to get out because the crab is escaping the barrel? And secondly, Mm -hmm. crabs don't live in barrels. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We're making a comparison of something that is unnatural. We're in an unnatural environment. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so we have to flip what we say about each other. The power of life and death is in the tongue, uh, Pastor. Yeah. Pastor, Pastor. Amen. All right, go ahead, Pastor. You got something to say? I don't forget the question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, doc, doc. Yeah, so one of the things I would say, and it probably goes back to a previous uh, question that you raised, and it's, it is around us as as leaders willing to be vulnerable, right. um, willing to speak our truth to these youth. And, I, and, and honestly, I tell people, you know, just because I'm in this suit, like the, the path that I traveled to get to where I am, man, it's no different. When I interviewed <coughs> for this job, I say, listen, I'm, I'm a Kansas City public school district student. I just happen to be from another city. I happen to be one that made it. And what I want to do is try to do everything in my power to provide hope to these to the kids that we're serving here. And there's a kid last year, he was graduating from Southeast High School. I mean, like this touched my heart. I went into the bathroom and he said to me, Dr. Bedell, I want you to know I'm proud of you. And I said, what are you, what are you proud of me for? It's the first time I ever had a student say, I'm proud of you. And he said, well, you came to my school when I was a sophomore, the first year you were here as superintendent. And you stood on that stage and you told us all of the mistakes you made. You told us about your brother being killed, your mother being a drug addict and ODing, your sister being murdered. And despite all of that, you being homeless, all of those things, you still made it. And he said, my mom told me I was headed down the path. I had been stabbed. I had been shot. I was out here in those streets bad. My mom said, you're not going to make it to your senior year. And he said to me, I, I, after hearing your conversation, after hearing that speech, that changed my life. And he said, I want you to know, man, like, I thank you for that. I never had a chance to do that. And I said to him, so what are you doing next year? The young man said, I'm going to Texas Southern University, you know, to enroll into college. And, you know, sometimes we get out here and we do these things and you don't know that it's making a difference. But like I said, you, if you can change the life of one, and those kids, they, they're hungry for people in here to just say to them, I grew up in the trap, I've been there, I don't went through these things. It makes a big difference. And then it's our job then in our positions that I'm in in particular to change the mindset of our educators and how they see our kids and how they show up and not to look at them from a low expectation standpoint or even from the way that the system has molded people to see us. So... I just wanted, because I think that begins to help to eliminate some of this stuff we're having in the community, but we got to be vulnerable. Yeah. I, I, got, I got a saying in my church, and it's, and it's, it's a little crass, but I'm going to say it anyway. I say there are no bastards in my church. And so that is, there's, there are no young people in my church who shall be fatherless, even if you are fatherless. I have several kids in my church, about five that I personally mentored, and two of the five I've already sent to college. One I just sent to college uh, about a month ago, came back after three days and said, I'm done with it. He called me. He said, I'm back. And I said, okay. I said, why? He said, I just didn't want to do it. I can't tell you why. I hung the phone up. An hour later, I showed up at his house. And I said some choice words to him in the living room <laughs> after I asked his grandmama and mama to leave. Um, and okay. the end of the story is he got back in the car and took his black so-and-so back to school. Because at this moment, I said, I ain't your, I ain't your pastor. I'm going to talk to you like I would my own son. And, and that's what you need. You need somebody to step into these young men in life and say to them, I'm going to be real with you. This is not going to go down. But because I almost raised this boy, I can have a conversation with him. I can snatch him up when somebody else can't do it because you don't have that relationship. I think it is going to boil down so to having those relationships with these young people. Is, is yes, sir. To be convicting, but wise enough to be the bandage to what you may be doing by convicting them and oh, showing them exactly right. what it is, why the, where the thinking comes from. You know what I mean? It, the difference between a leader and a shepherd. You know what I'm saying? Leaders have... I like to look at y'all as leaders, you know, the Vince Ford School District. I would be a shepherd because I understand the motion of why they're thinking like they think because I want to start that way and I know where it heads you and leads you to the worst. But Last year we this, talked about the truce dividing line and uh, what that means in terms of race, what that means in terms of class, what that means in terms of socioeconomics. Uh, has that stigma been erased even a tinge in the last year? Yeah. I think yeah. it's, it's, it's gone east a little bit now to – Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. Facts. Um, I, you know, um, the fact that the name and, and those opportunities, I, I said it earlier, they're not there for us, <laughs> honestly. And I know councilman, the council, uh, our council people and our mayor, I know they have worked 
hard to try to get some development. I feel like 18 and Vine, 18th and Vine is doing well, and I feel like that's better. We have, you know, like one or two more grocery stores within the east side, but there has to be more. And to be honest, it's not better. One thing that I think that when we talk about the, the truth divider and these kind of things that is, is somewhat missing, when we talk about the development, you, you got to have safe neighborhoods and safe areas that people want to invest their money in. Yeah. I think people make a mistake of making it sound like the city council or businesses, like there's a pot of money that you're just not giving to the east side. The other piece of this is we've got to help make the east side safer to make yeah. you want to invest your money because yeah. would you put your money into it sure. with the idea of the crime and different things that are going to make the return on your investment harder for you? Absolutely. So it's not just about having the city council and different people make the investment, we got to make the investment in Eastside ourselves no, to make it a safer is, place. I, I bought this whole building and the city maintains 100% of the blight in the 18th and Vine area. That's, that's a fact. When, uh, when the city wanted to put money and develop power and light, they did it. And the river market and all those other places, which were places where people weren't supposed to go. So yes, there literally is a pot of money that the city has that they're willing to develop other places, but they don't do it in the black community. Okay. And this is a perfect example of that. I put, I put, I put over eight hundred thousand dollars into this building to buy it. I did what people said to do: buy it in the community and keep it. The city maintains a hundred percent of the blight. That building across the street there is falling down. There's holes in the roofs of the things. And in the meantime, they're trying to take a building from a lady who I'm helping up the, the road, the, the, the Mardi Gras, who's fixing her building, has put hundreds of thousands of dollars, and they're trying to take that for blight. So, yes, there is an inequality, and there is a part of money that's being spent elsewhere. Part of that, too, is about making it safe. When you go to Power and Light, or when you go to <laughs> wherever else in the city besides 18th Divine, there are plenty of police, there's plenty of security, there's plenty of everything yep. there. When things were happening around here, 18th Divine, this year when there was a, a shooting or something, I, I DJ down here quite frequently. There's still no police around here. Exactly. You know, and, and I think that goes to your point and to your point about making it safer to invest. When we talk about the development and the difference around what happens east and west of truce, we go back to 1933 when redlining took place. As African Americans started moving into neighborhoods that were once vibrant, at least according to however folks defined it back then, then you had flight. People continued to move. With that movement then continued to have businesses leave our communities no investment coming back into those communities. And so ultimately for me, when I talk about this divider, and I started my opening remarks by saying the intentionality, the system is actually, the outputs we're getting in this system, that's the intentionality of how communities have been handled here dating back to that whole period. And so until we begin to, to talk about how we're gonna undo that and how we look at economic development in a very equitable manner, and it does go back to what the councilman said, ownership and being able to allow for people within those communities to have some opportunity for some type of economic growth, then it's this divider situation is just not going to get any better. I mean, it's, it's what this brother said early on. People watching don't all look like us. We got some women, women of color, white women. We have <laughs> white men, others who will be watching this. What role do they play in all this? What's your message to them? First, with us specifically, like I said earlier, we all have to play our part within our audience's lives, within our kids' lives that we all affect daily. Um, and, and to those from other ethnicities, I think one of, the, one of the bigger problems is try to be understanding of our backgrounds and our culture and how we do things. Just because we do things one way, and you do things another way. It doesn't make one way right or one way wrong. Just try to be a little more culturally sensitive, I would say, to our background. Because a lot of times, Kevin and everybody here, I know y'all can attest to this, we will, we will tell these stories about how we came up broke and how we had to, some people had to sell drugs. It, like you, you, we had to do that because that's our last alternative. That's some people's reality. And I feel like some people from other cultures don't believe that when in reality, that is some folks' day-to-day -day life. I would say, uh, just to kind of sum up what everybody was saying, I think we, if we take a, a core value of just uh, 
humanity and actually speaking when we see young kids out and stuff, you know, because sometimes you can pick up a person's vibe just by being in the store with them. Mm. And, and speak to that, that teenager, that young man, because nine times out of ten, they're lost, they're confused, they're hurt about something, they're dealing with some kind of mental issue. And you might say right. two or three words that would change you know, they might got that thing on them with something, you might change that whole narrative of what they was about to go do. So it's like, no matter what race you are, talk to that next man, talk to that next young lady, and just, just take high. You know, I say exactly. something goofy, I'll be like, you know, I smile, you smile, you know, we just we just chit chat for a minute. And that kind of, you build off of that. You know, I've exchanged numbers with people so many times just doing that because a lot of these kids, you said, all under the age of 24, man, them kids are hurt. Okay. Nobody's listening to them. Nobody's talking with them at home. They're talking at them. Um, I think my thing for our people, like the brother said on the end, is accountability. You know, for all of us, not just the brothers in this room. Um, in my opinion, the brothers that really can change these kids' perspective, can change these kids' mind states, are not here. The people that can really change these kids is the people that's on the block. The people that got the names in the city known for doing whatever. I can reach them, Ray can reach them, I'm pretty sure Bro can reach them, Joey can. You know, if we can get those brothers to tap in and actually help us, because these are they kids out here too. You know, so the thing about it is, is for me, is it's accountability, self-love, because a lot of us look in the mirror and we really don't love ourselves. But that's another thing of growing up in what you feel is a war zone. As far as everybody else, before you judge us, like my brother said, think with a little bit of humanity for a second. You're human just like we are. We're not animals, so don't judge us that way. Look at us the same way you look at your own. There's work to do. If I'm gonna sum up everything that needs, there's work to do for everybody. It's not, Sin Tzu says, he says, uh, uh, a general that goes into a war, into a battle, only on one front is doomed to fail. And it's insane saying that we have to attack this dragon, this multi-headed dragon from different angles. Every man here has a play, every man has a solution, every man has an idea. What, what changes the difference between workers and bosses and, and executives are people that can reason information, gather a group of thoughts and put them together into one specific play that can be broken down into goals and visions and make it applicable to be walked out. Uh, to the people that are listening that, that are not here, listen, there's a little girl that ain't gonna see her daddy. There's a, there's a, there's a child that's, that's 15 years old that lost her sister to gun violence. She, the people, this is real. And it's, if you think that it's, it's not going to cross the water into your home, you're sadly mistaken. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is if you, people here, we got stuff. If you have the funds, invest. Invest in your life and invest in other people's lives. And if you ain't got the money, talk about it. Because this type of conversation inspires change, even if it's just in conversation. To answer your question, to those that don't look like me, know that there isn't one way and we are made individually in, as uniqueness. Even the person next door to you isn't like you. You know what I'm saying? If y'all even got the same skin to my brothers, we, we all individually unique and we think differently. And the, 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 the thing to do is not connect because things of connection can be unplugged. Take my seasoning, take your seasoning and make a blend. You put sugar and salt in a bowl, you can't go get that sugar out no more. You know what I'm saying? And even more than that, to the brothers that are lost, you know what I'm saying? If we're going to be gentlemen to the kids and be gentlemen to where the man is not in the home because a man that's smarter makes the household smarter. A woman that's smarter makes the culture smarter. You know what I'm saying? And that's very important if we're going to be gentlemen to the kids. You know what I'm saying? You have to show a true respect to the woman and just cultivate that. It's our responsibility as the cream of the crop. I would just say that Whatever you're going to do, be real about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just real talk. Whoever I'm speaking with, when I first met Dr. Bedell, I said, how do you want it? Because he asked, tell me what's going on with the district. I said, how do you want it? Do you want me to be sugar-coated a little bit, or do you want me to put it on the table? He said, no, nah, be real about it. So when you start having those conversations with other individuals around you, it'd be superintendent, whoever's at the table, I'm just real about it, because this is what I see every day. This is what I deal with every day. I'm in the trenches. So when you're in the trenches, you see things a little different. When you're talking to people that may be on the outskirts, they're saying, well, I heard. Well, I'm telling you, I'm living it and I'm seeing it. It's the difference of what you're hearing. So if you want to be a part of it and change some things, take what you know, use your knowledge, and just give it to whatever kid walks past you. Mm -hmm. Don't have nothing to do with color.
Just a kid walk past. Mm -hmm. Give give him what you have. Give him the game. I want to give a concrete uh, a, a concrete thing that we can all do. I think I see and I do uh, family law. Uh, women that aren't here today. I think if you have a baby daddy, you should let him see your son. You should let him see your son. You should let that baby daddy into the life of the child. It doesn't matter what happened before, but you do need us. And I know, especially black women, we've, we've learned to sort of do things on our own, but you do need black men in the lives of black children. You need men, period, in the lives of, of boys. So let that happen. And men, claim your kid and raise them. There's statistically, you, rate, you age out of crime. Like if we did nothing else but just waited till somebody got to their 30s, they would, just, they would just stop committing crime. So if you're 30 years old and you got a kid out there and you've got all of this world experience on how life should work, just claim and raise your child. If we just did that, then we would, we'd be bit off. Claim your child, baby, baby mom would let baby daddy see their kids, and you as men, all of us here, if you got friends who are not seeing their kids, or, babe, or you know women who are not letting that happen, make, make them do it. Stay on them. Uh, it's simple for me. Just stop approaching us through this deficit lens. Um, I think too often people look at us and they see us as a threat. They see us as folks who cannot do anything productive. And they treat us in that manner. I would also say to people that's viewing this taping, there's a lot of people that have a tremendous amount of privilege in this city. And understanding that the goal should be to make Kansas City a great city for all. We have an opportunity to take and leverage our privilege to help uplift those that have been shut out of the Kansas City opportunity and the United States opportunity. And I would say to people, um, it's not gonna cost you anything but a little bit of time and effort and, and a shift in the mindset if you truly want this city to be a great city. So use that privilege. Be optimistic. Uplift. Be optimistic. Yeah. You know, I, I think as we talk to people who aren't here today, what we need in Kansas City, uh, people outside the urban core to come back and give their time, talent, and treasure. We need more people to volunteer. There's everybody, there was probably 10 different organizations on this panel that could use volunteers to come back and help. I think there's a lot of good people in Kansas City that mm. care about Kansas City, but you got- My final thoughts, I think the scripture sums it up when it's the scripture that says, a house divided against itself cannot stand. This is not a black problem. It's not an urban core problem. It's not an east side problem. It's a Kansas City problem. And I think it takes all of us to come together to address and fix this problem. To those who are watching, and even to the brothers in the room, um, fatherhood has very little to do with biology. In other words, a kid doesn't have to be a biological child for you to be their father. So fatherhood is your responsibility. Uh, and uh, our kids will, will be who they see. <coughs> so allow them to see you, uh, because I think there's, there's some positivity and some life in this room that kids need to have access to. And then shifting the conversation to this economic prosperity, uh, I've been fortunate to be a part of this planning committee that's doing this talk about shared prosperity. And you know, we've been talking about gentrification, and it's become a bad word. And the, tr the truth of the matter is technically, gentrification and revitalizing our community is never a bad thing. It's just that when we're not engaged in the process, it's a bad there thing. It is. Right? So we need to be in, 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 engaged in the process. So. On October the 2nd, in the Jazz Museum Atrium, there's a conversation that's going to be a part of at 3 o'clock. I need you brothers to be there. 3 o'clock from 3 to 5 is a reception talking about shared prosperity for this community. Final thought. Hey, so what I'll do, uh, before we get to you, Sergeant, what I'll do, i get everybody's email address. I'll send a mass email out so we can always respond to that thread, too, with that detail. All right, Sergeant. When people ask me what can be done, I say to them, look at what you're passionate about and take that knowledge, that information, and give it to other people. Give it to young people. If you like doing yard work, teach a kid how to cut the grass, because hopefully that young person will grow up and need to know how to do that. Be a father, a positive influence to you, your children, and those that are around you. And the last thing is, be kind and compassionate to others. Kindness costs nothing.
The barbershop is that spotlight in our community. When we open up on 39th Indiana, 2008, we open up in the middle of what they was calling the murder factory, the highest crime, murder, and prison rate for the whole state of Missouri. Now, for me, stats, like you, you addressed earlier, stats can be a tricky thing because although we saying, yeah, we had 102 murders, well, let's break down that stats. How many of those, you know what I'm saying, individuals are going through certain things or how many of these people got common type of denominators in, fact, uh, in play? But also, at the same time, what's the percentage of how many businesses was opened up? Have we opened up more businesses since 2016 versus 2019? Have there been more graduates since 2016 to 2000? You know what I mean? Like, what's some of the other positive stats? And I think, I'm hoping, as we come back, we can kind of shed light on more of those type of topics.